Welcome to Christ in Prophecy in our Jesus in the Old Testament series. Nathan and I have been looking forward to working our way through the Minor Prophets for some time, not only because he wrote a book focusing on these often overlooked messengers from God, but also because they offer so much insight into God's prophetic plan. Exactly, Tim, and thanks for the plug. Yes. <laughs> the Minor Prophets came from a variety of backgrounds and utilized a variety of techniques to communicate the Word of the Lord. Well, today we're going to turn our attention to Hosea. At 14 chapters long, Hosea ties with Zechariah, but ironically, both are longer than Daniel, who is considered a major prophet. You know, the importance of the prophets' messages cannot be judged by the length of their books. All served the Lord faithfully and pointed toward the coming anointed one, the Messiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah called the righteous branch. Michael Branch is the pastor of Bright Star Bible Church in Glenpool, Oklahoma, and a good friend of this ministry. So, Michael, we want to welcome you to Christ in Prophecy today. Certainly glad to be here today, gentlemen. I'm excited. Well, we are excited too. And we want to establish right up front for our viewers that although we are talking about Hosea, you bear little resemblance to Hosea in a very important way. You have been blessed with a wife who is a wonderful helpmate in your ministry. And as a matter of fact, we want to bring our viewers a very special treat by bringing a favorite hymn to them, sung by your wife and your two daughters. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness lord unto me You know, what a wonderful way to start this episode and a great blessing for all of us. Folks, we're looking at the time of Hosea back in 750 to 715 BC. So his prophetic ministry was centered at about 740 BC. He ministered to the northern tribes of Israel. He was a loving, forgiving a pro a guy. He was an acting prophet. He performed. Uh, so the Lord then asked him to act a particular message out, and it was to go marry a harlot yeah. and have children with her. Why would God ask Hosea to do that? Well, you know, it, it seems that they were ignorant of God's ways, that they had rebelled and it just, you know, uh, kept snowballing over time and, and God had had enough. And They being the nation itself. That's right, that, the nation of Israel. And, and so God was using 
you know, Hosea as an object lesson, if you will. And we would look at that and think, whoa, wait a second, God, what, what's going on here? But, you know, I believe that anytime you obey God, even in circumstances such as that, you're going to get a, a, a deep spiritual blessing out of that. I think Hosea probably did as well. And when you look at the original Hebrew, it's not necessarily that she was a harlot, but a woman of unfaithfulness. Yes. And since she was a woman of unfaithfulness and Israel as God's wife was a a group of unfaithful people, he became a human object lesson, that's didn't right. he? That's right. Yeah, that's okay. right. I think sometimes we don't catch the fact that sometimes our lives are object lessons. Do we treat them that way? Do we use it, uh, circumstances of our lives as opportunities to glorify God, or do we just kind of mope in our own uh, dissatisfaction at times? Sure. Well, you know, I think with, with all believers, if, if we're not careful, we'll sink into a life of uh, kind of mediocrity, and uh, we're going through the motions. Uh, where we become religious, relying on the traditions of men, and, and eventually the love is lost. And that's really no different, uh, as we read in the Old Testament, uh, no different than being unfaithful to God. When you begin to, you're in a way, you're worshiping an idol of just uh, comfort and mediocrity. Johnny Erickson Tata was with us recently, and her life is a living oh, testimony man. of faithfulness to God, regardless of circumstances, and overflowing with joy in spite of circumstances, yeah. dare we say. You know, one of the things I find very tragic about Hosea's life was he was told to give his children's names that were meant to communicate prophetic warnings yeah. to the people of Israel. And their names were, were very strange. Uh, do you have a recollection of what some of those names well, were in this book? Well, yeah, I mean, Jezreel, God sows, you know, he will visit bloodshed on the house of uh, Jehu. Oh my. That doesn't sound good. Uh, and I'm not necessarily great at pronouncing the names, I'm sure as you guys are too, but Lo Ruhama, she has not obtained compassion, and Lo Ami, not my people. In other words, I will not be their God any longer. So, you know, our, our, our usual response to something like that, because we're talking about uh, God telling them to name their children something in a prophetic message, and it was fulfilled yes. that the, the kids would go astray. It's almost as if God, uh, in our minds, was unfairly you know, treating the children or blaming the children for something that the mother had done. And, uh, but we need to understand the God we're dealing with and that He's always just and He's always righteous. And, you know, those, those children, uh, as we see later, sowing the wind, reaping the whirlwind, those children were just as uh, complicit in what was going on as, as the mom was. What's interesting with Hosea, his relationship to his children is because Gomer was unfaithful, and what a name, Gomer, yeah. that the children were likely not even his and still he had to take care of them. So we see these different dynamics of relationships here. And there's also a dynamic between Hosea and God that he has a special pet name for him. What was uh, Hosea's name for God, a term well, of endearment? That, it's Ishi, which is my husband, right? And, and then you've got the other name, uh, which is Bali, and my master, or the Baals, uh, these false idols that Israel uh, was was uh, so prone to to follow after and worship, and so it speaks of the relationship or a transformation of relationship. In uh, you know the way you love your wife is obviously obviously going to be different than than how you treat your office assistant, right? Or at least it it better be, and uh, and so. This really points to the transformation in for us in the life of a, of a believer is, uh, you know, when we truly know Christ, there's a, a true transformation that takes place in us. There's a relationship of intimacy. We know Him and He knows us, and that's really what this is talking about here. It reminds me of Romans 9, 25 and 1 Peter 2, 10, where it creates a relationship between the church and God, of course, Christ over the church is considered the head, but he's also considered a groom and we're the bride. And it's neat that when you read the Old Testament, God looked at Israel sometimes as a child. There's all sorts of different sure. uh, relationships it's compared to, but also as a wife. And Hosea's wife, Gomer, was a cheating, self-centered, <laughs> evil type of woman. And that's what God's wife had become. That's right. And, and you know, we are no different in, in our faithfulness to the Lord. I mean, there's nothing uh, in our own righteousness that has any appeal to God. You know, our righteousness is as filthy rags. So, 
it's wonderful that our relationship as the bride relies upon the faithfulness of the bridegroom. Isn't that nice? <laughs> it, it is certainly is. And that's why the, the song your girls sang today is so beautiful and captures God's faithfulness. He is a, a faithful bridegroom even when we have proven faithless. And of course our, our goal is to be faithful to our, our loving Savior, but he, his love for us is so much greater and unfathomable. And yes. so as that husband, he is the faithful one. And Hosea does stand in as a type. Yes. You know, I think it also shows the links to which our loving bridegroom will go to rescue his bride. Absolutely. When, when you look at the, uh, almost the poetry, the imagery of uh, there's a passage, you know, in, in I believe chapter two, where Gomer or, or Israel, because we know they, they're kind of connected, you know, um, I will, I will uh, lead her into the wilderness, almost this imagery of romancing her, speaking kindly to her, providing for her, uh, giving her everything she needs. And then, and then the result of that, of her true repentance, the result of her true repentance is God pouring out his compassion. Mm -hmm. And then in that compassion and mercy, you see this transformation in her where she begins to sing. Like, like Israel did when they were freed from Egypt. There's this burden that's been lifted off of their shoulders. And now she's singing in freedom and this, this, the joy of this romance or being romanced by God, you know. Michael, uh, one of the joys of writing 12th Faith Journeys of the Minor Prophets was uh, I led every chapter with a little historical fiction to kind of introduce you to the person. And one of the ones that really touched my heart was something that Hosea did to Gomer. Back in that time period, as you know, if you got into debt, you were sold into slavery. And at this point, because of her excessive living and her prostitution, she was so much in debt that she was put on the auction block to be sold. What did Hosea do, very similar to what Christ did for us for Gomer? Wow. I mean you know, he bought her and he purchased her the same way Christ purchased us with his precious blood, uh, Paul says. So, um, you know, we are the benefactors of the bridegroom paying the bride price, purchasing us, and, and uh, even though we were so unworthy uh, of even being purchased the way Gomer was. I think there's a demonstration as well because Gomer continued to return almost as the scripture says, like a dog to its vomit, to her former lifestyle. And I think there's another good fictional account of this in The Chosen, where Mary Magdalene still feels the weight of her past that just wants to drag her back into, how am I possibly worthy of being in relationship with Jesus Christ? And yet Jesus is so very gracious to bring her back to himself and back into that relationship. He's not gonna let her go even though her past wants to drag her down. I think too many of us as Christians have, have baggage in our lives that has been forgiven of us by our Lord and Savior, and yet it still wants to pull us back. Satan is trying to drag us, and Jesus as our perfect bridegroom is faithful to continually redeem us over and over again, once for all by His Amen. blood, but He is gracious to continually pull us back into relationship. Yeah, we often forget that, that you know, there's a lot of um, weight on our shoulders, on our hearts and minds with the shame of our past. And, uh, and sometimes letting go of that is, is hard for us. And we need to remember that, as you said, man, thrown into the sea of forgetfulness, uh, he, he forgets it. And, and never thinks of it again. And, mm. and so, but for us, I think sometimes we have to walk those steps. It takes a little while for us to remind ourselves over and over, go back to scripture and see that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, in this Jesus in the Old Testament series, we're looking for actual Christophanies or Theophanies, appearances of Jesus Christ. We're looking for typologies, uh, people or events or the symbols that point to Jesus. I think we've got a really strong one here in the book of Hosea. Yeah. Would you say that Hosea is a type of Christ? Yeah, I, I'm actually fascinated by those Old Testament Christophanies, you know, um, Christ appearing in Scripture before He ever was born in Bethlehem. And uh, yeah, there's a very powerful one here. I mean, just what we've been talking about with the, the bridegroom and the bride and or the sinner and the, the kinsman redeemer or the, you know, and I think that this is a powerful story in that regard. So. You know, I said uh, that we sometimes have to be reminded that we have been forgiven. Christ is gracious to continually pull us into relationship. But there's another side to what is presented in Hosea. To those who have, whom have been called, there is a higher expectation that yes. we will try to remain faithful to God. So 
he has great uh, condemnation, if you will, for the nation of Israel because they should have known better than to stray from him. And I think Jesus, even in his ministry, uh, had a condemnation for certain cities who he ministered to, who, who witnessed firsthand his graciousness, his mercy, mercy, his power of healing and of ministering, and yet they rejected him. And we need to take seriously our call to remain faithful to our faithful God. Well, you know, the, the, the reference of uh, they, they have sown the wind and they reap the whirlwind. Jose 8, 7. Yeah, yeah. amazing. And, and, uh, and I think that what we should take from that is when leadership is weak, I think about actually, um, you know, where there is no vision, uh, the people perish. Yeah. And, and if you drill down into that, it, where there is no prophetic word, where there is no, no uh, God-given word to guide the people, in our, in our case, the Word of God, when leadership, uh, you know, tries to lead without the direction of the Word of God, what happens is the people are unrestrained, there is no vision, the people perish, they, they flounder, they wind up, you know, it's like an F4 tornado, it's the <laughs> whirlwind. And, you know, we see this in Scripture over and over again as the, the father and uh, the sins visited upon the son and the grandchildren. And I think what we need to realize is that sometimes when we're sowing the wind, 10 years, 20 years from now is when in the lives of our children and grandchildren, that's when utter chaos ensues. And we need to be thinking about that always and never let our foot off the gas in our pursuit of Him, knowing that He's always pursuing and us. And passing that information on in chapter 4, verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, yes. because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. children. That's right. And boy, what a powerful indictment that is that we sometimes say, oh, look at these young people, they're straying. Why are they straying? Because those who should have been passing down to them knowledge of the true and living God have not done so faithfully. Boy, that is a challenge and an indictment for all of us as we witness the world going amok today. Absolutely. Well, look at the time period. This is 740 B.C. When was uh, the tri 10 tribes of northern tribes taken? 722. They mm -hmm. were taking only 18 years later wow. after this message, which means then the, what did the people do? They rejected Hosea's message. Mm -hmm. They didn't repent. They, they didn't, didn't return to the Lord. They kept in. And so God's like, I'm done with them. And that, I think, applies greatly to the United States, wouldn't you say? Because we as a nation yeah. have had prophet after prophet. We've had signs of nature and society. We've had preachers and teachers like yourself at your church preaching the word. If the next generation doesn't accept it and, and ask for forgiveness, is America doomed to destruction? Well, I mean, I think America is going to go the same path that any other nation would as we see in Romans 1. I mean, you read Romans 1, you see it laid out there that God's judgment is revealed in this way against a nation that would shirk their responsibility in raising up their children and walking the path of, of, of righteousness. So, um, very clear picture there of, of how a nation will crumble you know, to the very foundations. Certainly, well, I love the fact that you brought up the passage in Hosea 8 about reaping or sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. Back in chapter 5, verse 14, the Lord says, I, even I, will tear to pieces, talking about the house of Judah, yeah. his own chosen people, I will carry away and there will be none to deliver, almost giving them over. But then he says this in verse 15, I will go away and return to my place until yes. they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. So even this going away has a purpose, and that is to drive people toward repentance Amen. and toward recognizing how in the world have we strayed so far from the Lord that He would abandon us, and we have no other hope than return to Him. That is the, the meaning of repent. And so even in this abandonment wrath, so to speak, there is a, a message of salvation that is inherent if people will simply repent, turn to the Lord, he is waiting to save and to be gracious. Amen. You know, uh, in speaking about this nation especially, you know, we, we, often, uh, we often quote, if my people who are called by na my name will humble themselves, you know, and, and, and all of that applies. The principle, um, yes. That's right, the principle, right. And we, of course, know that he was specifically speaking to Israel. But 
Um, what a beautiful picture, though, of God's compassion and His mercy. And, and it also just rolls right over if we look at our own lives and how we are unfaithful and how we often blow it. <laughs> at oh, least man. I know I do. I can't speak for you, but, oh. you know, you blow it and God, you know, His mercies are new every morning. And that's what the beauty of chapter 11 in Hosea. Uh, you really can feel God's heart in this. He feels betrayed. He's angry. He's, he, he's frustrated as, as much as a divine being can be. Sure. And he pours out his anguish. He says, verse 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called him my son. He's saying, hey, I treated you like, like an heir, like a child. I loved you. He says, so they went from them and they sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carve images. You can hear just God's heart breaking. Do you think that God's heart is breaking for His people today, especially the church as it gets totally apostate? Of course it is. I mean, you know, God's heart is breaking because He is love, but uh, those whom He loves, He's going to chasten. And I think we should be very worried if, if there were no chastening. I think mm. these, you know, what I would call remedial judgments, this uh, abandonment wrath is, is actually evidence that God is still giving this nation an opportunity, mm. you know, to, to repent and return. And I pray that that's exactly what we'll do as a nation. Yeah, I, I do too. I, I have my doubts. But there's also a point that we as individual Christians are also told in the New Testament not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Mm. You say, well, what am I doing to grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, are, are we, am I in a intentional relationship with the Lord God Almighty? Am I looking to Him daily and staying in that close relationship? I know that Jesus Christ is yearning to be regathered with His bride yes. uh, collectively, which is the rapture itself. Am I yearning for that glorious event? Right. Or am I just kind of going about my life oblivious to the desire to be united with Christ? And so I think grieving the Holy Spirit can be through acts of commission, but frankly, it sometimes can be through a, a, a oblivion of omission, even of that heartfelt desire for the Lord's return, for Him to be glorified, and for me to be reunited with Him. The Bible is so clear about His imminency and that the bride is to make herself ready, you know? And of course, we know that, that the Holy Spirit is the one who is sanctifying us, making us more like Christ. But we have to also put ourselves in a position uh, of, of being, of receiving that, that sanctifying work of the Spirit, you know? And so, yeah, we can, we can shirk our responsibility. We can be lazy. We can uh, be careless. And, uh, and I think that we should always be pursuing Him as best we can. And if we are faithful to do that, God is so good in, I think, doing what He did with with, uh, you know, Gomer and, and Israel so many times, receiving them, romancing them. I mean, it's just, if you know the Lord and you're intimate with the Lord, it is a beautiful thing. And I, I couldn't live without it. Oh, man. amen, brother. Uh, well, when Hosea had to buy Gomer off the auction block, the price for a slave at that time was 30 pieces of silver. It seems uh -huh. like he only had 15, and so he gave barley as the other. So basically 30 pieces of silver to buy Gomer out of her life of sin. What did Jesus pay to buy us out oh, of our yeah. lives of sin? I mean, the ultimate, the ultimate price. But, you know, we, ought, we think a lot about the physical pain that he endured and all of that. But the fact is that you know, Christ received upon Himself the wrath of His own Father, mm. uh, the wrath that I deserved. He took upon Himself. He took my place. And, and we often focus so much on His physical suffering when we need to really think about the fact that it was my own personal sin that He received that payment, God's wrath. He drank the cup of God's wrath on my behalf so that I could be free and I could have that intimacy with the Father. In Psalm 22, which he quoted from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken yes. me? The first time the Trinity was broken. Yes. Yeah. I think we who have been grafted into this family of God are proof that uh, even the prophecy, prophetic word that came in chapter 2, verse 23, this is one of our key verses, I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they will say, thou art oh, my, my God. God. And boy, that is my testimony. Our other key verse being in chapter 3, verse 5, talking about the sons of Israel returning and seeking the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling. And that is 
to happen yet when uh, a great number of the Jewish people look upon him whom they have pierced yes. and cry out as for an only uh, begotten son, and that will occur. But right now we are blessed, again, to have been a fulfillment of some of these verses to recognize Jesus as our Savior, to embrace Him as our soon returning King and our glorious Bridegroom. Amen. We can be hard on Israel sometimes, can't we? Uh, seeing how many times they reject the Lord. Uh, but we also know, you know, Paul says in Romans 11 that they're under a partial hardening, that this is God's plan, and it was for our benefit because the gospel would have never been offered to you and I, to the Gentiles, had they not rejected Christ when they did. That's so, we're the benefactors of, of their rebellion, but we, we know that He has promised that He would redeem them. He hasn't cut them off for good. It, it's all throughout the pages of the Old Testament. You know, the Song of Moses, you see it there that, that yeah, He's going to desolate you. He's going to be brutal to you, but He will not leave you in that place. No. There's coming a day when He will restore you and all the promises of the Kingdom with that. So, give us a final word, so to speak, from the book of Hosea. How does He end His entire book? And it's right there in chapter 14, verse 9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. What, what I mean, just a picture of human nature. It's like, you know, if you are receptive to the Lord, if you, uh, you know, if you seek Him and you listen when He's calling you, right? He opens our eyes and we respond. That's the way the Lord works. And uh, there are always going to be those who love the darkness more than the light. But we don't know who those are, do we? So, uh, it's our job to just uh, spread the gospel, tell as many people as we possibly can, because the time is short. Well, Michael, thanks again for being here with us today on Christ in Prophecy and for bringing your beautiful wife and daughters and gifting and blessing us with a worshipful song that touched everyone's hearts. Well, I was certainly glad to be here, and I'm blessed beyond measure with my wife, with my daughters. I'm glad they could be here to bless everyone else as well. Amen. Amen. Well, we call this lesson Hosea, Loving as God Loves, because as a husband, Hosea loved his wayward wife with selfless and sacrificial love. You have to wonder if his heart was not in turmoil at the indignity of having to purchase his own wife as she sold herself on the street, but his dramatic demonstration of unfailing and unmerited love pointed to the Lord God. You know, I pray that when our Heavenly Bridegroom comes, He finds us faithful. Still, we will never match the faithfulness of God, as the lady sang about today. Until the Lord comes, we intend to faithfully proclaim His prophetic word, pointing people to our Heavenly Bridegroom. Our goal is to motivate believers to urgent evangelism, holy living, and keeping their eyes on Jesus, and to warn unbelievers to flee from the wrath to come and into the loving arms of our Savior. Please consider joining us in that effort by becoming a Prophecy Partner. For only $25 a month, you can ensure that the message that Jesus is coming soon will be proclaimed far and wide. As a Prophecy Partner, you'll get our Lamplighter magazine every other month, as well as other gifts and updates on Lamb and Lion Ministries. If you would be willing to partner with us, just call the number on the screen or visit our website. You'll be helping others grow in knowledge of our soon returning King. Well, that's our show for today. Join Nathan and me next week for another episode of Christ in Prophecy. Until then, look up and be watchful for our Lord, our Heavenly Bridegroom, who is coming for the Bride of Christ, is coming soon. Godspeed.